All right. So next up, we have Lou Zonka from uh, Pompeo Fabro University, and she'll be continuing on this morning's theme. So this orders of consciousness. And uh, thank you for the invitation. So yeah, I'm a postdoc in Gustavo Degos group in uh, Pompeo Fabra in Barcelona. And today I'm going to be telling you about like uh, modeling disorders of consciousness and also like data dimensionality reduction. So just like a quick overview of the talk, the idea is that we have like this ephemeral data, patients with disorders of consciousness, as Hako explained to us this morning. And the idea is that we want to first perform some sort of dimensionality reduction on this data for various reasons that I'm going to tell you about. And then work in this like reduced dimensional space where we could be like doing modeling in this space uh, and so making this model that we could calibrate to each individual patient. And from there, try to extract, extract like biomarkers or like emergent features and understand more about what's going on with these patients. So uh, basically, the outline of the talk is, well, I'm going to very quickly tell you about disorders of consciousness, but basically, I already did all the introduction for me. And then we're going to talk about the dimensionality reduction. So basically, like, how, why we, why we want to do that? How do we go to this uh, latent uh, reduced space? And what would be like the best method, the best dimension? And from then on, we're going to be building the single patient model. So I'm going to tell you about two different models, so two different approaches of, of, of modeling. And then very quickly, a bit about like the parameter fitting and some of like very preliminary results from my current uh, postdoc work. So most of it is, is still ongoing work. It's not published except from like some parts of the models. So any feedback is welcome and also uh, you can interrupt me at any time if you want to have questions. There's no need to it for the end. So, okay, uh, as I told you this morning, you have this patient who like had some serious brain injury. They get into a coma, they wake up, but sometimes they don't like completely recover. And also there's like some uh, clinical procedures to group the patients into like different uh, discrete states. It's really more of a spectrum. So you, had, you can have patients that have like more or less motor function, more or less cognitive function, and that somewhere in there. And so the idea is that because it's more of a spectrum, although we know like we can put the patients within this group, as Hako also told us, there's a lot of variability within the groups. So that's why we kind of want to do this single patient modeling approach. So we can have like a more personalized approach and try to understand more uh, individual at the individual level, what's going on with each patient and can we like in the long run make like better prognosis and things like that. So, it's just the database, so the data I have, so I work with Hako in this group, so some fMRI patients from there and some of them from uh, Liège, from the Giga Consciousness Group in the University of Liège. So in total, it's 100. This is actually not completely true. It's like 140 patients because I had to take some off, but it's more or less the idea. And they're divided in three groups. So you have the control groups in blue, the minimally conscious group in dark red, and in green, the unresponsive state. And so, well, as many people have already uh, talked about um, uh, before in the workshop, so what do you do when you have like this fMRI data? First, you have to decide of, on like a uh, parcellation, so apply an atlas. So you have to decide which atlas you're, you're going to apply to. You don't know if this is going to have an effect on your data. Uh, <laughs> So yesterday, that maybe like this defi like static definition of the regions could be problematic. Then from this day, but anyway, you have to do it because we want to have time series that we can work on to make our models. No, so then you can like extract a, a signal, so a, a time series from each region. So usually it's done like by averaging over the whole region, and then you can do more or less pre-processing steps like denoising. There's like debate about whether you should regress out different features. So there's like this global signal regression thing, filtering. I'm more party to usually do like the less better because you always have this trade-off between regressing out more things. So you know that what 
you stay with is actual information, but maybe you lost lots of it, or maybe you regress as less things, and then you keep some some noise, but maybe there's some information in this noise, maybe. So this is a bit unclear. What I usually do is that I just uh, perform a first step, uh, a very basic step of band pass filtering. What people mostly do in fMRI, at least in our group, is that they do this very narrow band between 0 0.04 and 0 0.07 hertz, which is where most of the information carried by the signal, the bulk signal is supposed to be. I extend it a bit, so I do it between 0 0.01 and 0 0.1 to make sure I don't cut like too much information. And also because, as I said, uh, I'm actually going to do some dimensionality reduction. And actually, dimensionality reduction is going to take care for me of like getting rid of all this like noise in every signal. So, so how do you, so why do you want to do that? There's various causes. Now, so first you have so I said. You apply your parcellation, so it can have like a hundred regions, you can have like a thousand regions, then you have like one time series per region, so that's like a lot. Then you have like all these questions about pre-processing, how do I get rid of the noise? So when you do dimensionality reduction, the idea is usually that you get rid of the noise and you just keep like the informative features of your data. So that's like, and if there's like redundancy because of like the parcellation you've chosen or something, then you also get rid of that. So, well, most basic way of doing um, dimensionality reduction is to do principal component analysis. So here I, I took the same data, I applied like this Scheffler parcellation with 100 or 1000 uh, regions, and then you look at basically, so this is on average of those patients, how many eigenvalues do you need? So how many components do you need to explain how much variance? But this is very basic and it doesn't tell me really like much in which dimension I should stop. So, so how much of these variants with like basically unpreprocessed data I really want to explain now. So another approach uh, what we do now in the group is to use autoencoders. So for those who are not familiar with autoencoders, they are like um, artificial neural networks. So they have like this symmetric architecture where you have like first uh, various layers of decreasing dimension. So that are going to take your initial data, reduce the dimension, uh, so you get to a bottleneck or like a, what we also call the latent space. So this is the dimension that we want to determine. And then you have a symmetric uh, structure, which is a decoder, which is layers of increasing dimensions to bring your data back to uh, its original dimension. So initially, these artificial neural networks that were developed a lot for like a image compression or things like that. So the idea is to like keep most of and, and denoising. So like you keep all the informative features, so you reduce to the dimension that's actually like the intrinsic dimension of the information that you have in your signals. And then when you build again, well, you just got, you just lost the noise and the uninformative features, no? Uh, so in practice, what I do, uh, because I told you I have like 140 patients, so if I take like one whole patient and put it in, it's 140 data points. This is not enough to train an artificial neural network. So what I do is that I split the time series into for each time point. So each time point gives me like a vector of dimension uh, 100 or 1000, less the dimension of the original parcellation. And this is each of each of these vectors is one data point, mm -hmm. and I train it of that. So, like basically, you train the, the autoencoder to minimize the difference between the input and the output. So, for each vector, I have a so you have like a small vector in the latent space, and then you have the reconstructed data, and then you take the uh, mean squared error for each time point, and this is what you want to minimize. So then, in practice, I just split the data so the patient into uh, 90% um, training, 10% test, and I do the uh, k-fold cross-validation. And the idea is that we want to know in which dimension we need to, to go. So what I did is to train autoencoders with uh, the latent dimension, so the bottleneck dimensions going from 2 to 25. And then every time you look at your mean square uh, reconstruction error. And so first, when the dim latent dimension is too small, so it's smaller than what you actually have in your information, you're going to have a higher uh, error. And then it's going to drop until reaching like some sort of elbow where you can like increase more. You don't need more. So you're not going to have like a better 
uh, reconstruction error because you already, so basically like the idea is that when you get this elbow where it stabilizes is more or less uh, your dimension. And so one of the questions was, uh, does the initial parcellation uh, affect these results or like how should I choose it, no? So what I did is to do, to perform the same data with this uh, Schaffer parcellation. So it's only cortical regions with 100 regions, the same one with 1000 regions. And then also to see like how uh, subcortical uh, regions could affect the result. I added this uh, Tian parcellation for, to, to have subcorticals. And what we see is that basically it makes no difference. So this is good news because it means that it doesn't matter how I parcelate my data initially, then to like the amount of information that there is the same data. So the amount of information that there is the same. So it's like as it should be, I would say, <laughs> like it's not really surprising. What we also see is that when I add the subcortical regions, it adds a lot of noise. So you see these peaks, but globally it's like you get the same results. So that's one good news because then I don't have to worry anymore too much about like which parcellation I'm gonna apply. The other question is that, so I have these three patients group, no? So maybe you're gonna say, oh, uh, UWS patients, maybe they have like less complex uh, dynamics, so they would need like a smaller dimension or, uh, well, yes or no. Turns out, so with the same autoencoders, then I just computed the MSC for each group of uh, patients and controls, and it turns out it makes no difference. So, so basically, what we know now is that we have this elbow that it's not super clear, but it's somewhere around like 60, 13 and 16. So this would be like the order of magnitude of the dimension. And we, we have, I actually have some colleagues who did like similar analysis on different data sets, and we always find out like the same more or less order of magnitude for like the good dimension. Another thing, uh, so another thing we did is that we know that in the natural space, we know how to, based on the functional connectivity, so this correlation between the region, we know pretty well how to train like a, a classifier to distinguish between these three groups of patients. So basically, if we don't lose any information uh, when we're doing the dimensionality reduction, we should be able to still do at least as well when we go to the, to the latent space. So this is a bit of a sanity check, and it was also to see whether like, doing the dimensionality reduction with PCA or to encoder would make a bit, of, a bit of a difference. So I trained a super vector machine once again for each latent dimension between two to 25. And I compared for, so the autoencoder is from, so both cases starting now with the Schaeffer parcellation without the subcorticals. And so at each step, I do the dimensionality reduction, and then I take like this latent functional connectivity matrices, which are just like the correlation between the regions, and you train like the, the super vector machine to try to distinguish between these three conditions. So because these three conditions, a chance level would be at point 33, which is like this dash, dashed right green line. Uh, this black line, black solid line is um, the classification accuracy in the source space. And what we want to do is to know what is the smallest dimension where you, we do at least better, which is here. And once again, it's like uh, it's like 14 for the autoencoder. We see that we don't like have much difference between autoencoder and PCA, basically, which is also good news because it means that no matter how you get to this latent space, what counts is really like this, like you just extract like some relevant information that you have in this data. So, just to sum up this part, we, we saw that this initial dimension did not affect the optimal dimension. It, not, it did not ameliorate anything to add the subcortical regions into the mix. And we can also get a good uh, classification with the PCA, but in the end we discussed it and we figured like PCA is like a linear method. All these processes we are looking at are like intrinsically non-linear and maybe like it's, so maybe it's better to like keep the autoencoder. So Starting from now, we're going to go into this latent space. Uh, so we start with this uh, Schaeffer 100 parcellation, and we project all the data in a dimension 15 with an autoencoder. And now we're going to do the modeling. So basically, what we want to do, what we do a lot in the Gustavo's group, is uh, usually whole brain models. So whole brain models, they're like a network of nodes. 
that are connected together by some connectivity matrix. So it could be functional, it could be effective, it could be structural, depending on what you're doing, what data you have also. And then in each node, you can put basically whatever you want. So you're gonna have like usually like a small dynamical system, a very classical model that we use a lot that works pretty well to capture lots of features of the data is a HOPF uh, model that I'm gonna tell you about in a minute. But then you could also put like in the node, like some more, uh, like you can put whatever you want basically in the node. You just want to reproduce the signal. So that's the idea when you're doing modeling is that you choose your model according to what you want to investigate, now what mechanisms you're interested in. So you could also put like some more biologically inspired models here, depending on what you're interested in. So I'm going to tell you also about one of these more biologically inspired models. And basically, now we're in the latent space, so I'm going to have 15 nodes instead of having 100, but it's like, it's the same procedure, no? So uh, the HOPF model, it's a very classical model. It's just that you have this uh, normal form of a HOPF bifurcation. So basically, uh, this would be just, if you just look at this part, it would be what's going on in one node. You have this bifurcation parameter A. When it's negative, you have a single uh, fixed point, uh, a real attractor. So you, your dynamics will just be like small fluctuations, uh, random fluctuations around the attractor. And then when A becomes positive, then you get a complex conjugate eigenvalues, and then you're gonna have a limit cycles, a limit cycle, so you're gonna have oscillations. Then you have this term that just like it, or the network interaction term. So here the J is a connectivity matrix that we will have to determine, and how each node is the other node in pure the dynamics of the node I, and then this additive noise term. We have also, well, here I, I left it this uh, G parameter, which is like the global coupling. So it's just like a, a scalar that is here to scale like the importance of this like network term. In my case, because I'm going to do some fitting for the, uh, the connectivity matrix, I fit, I fit it to one because you can basically just put it in there and then it's going to adjust uh, within the fitting. Uh, so that's the first model. It's very nice because we know, like, there's been lots of studies uh, with this model. We know we can capture, like, good information from fMRI with it. The only problem is that it's very abstract, you know, so we don't really have, like, a biological interpretation for what you see. So another approach would be to, inside each node, put a more biologically relevant model. No? The one I'm going to tell you uh, today about is a model based on neuronal population bursting. So if you look at a much smaller scale, at a population of neurons that are connected together, what can happen sometimes is that so they start firing and then at some point they synchronize and you see like these big bursts uh, of activity over the whole network. So the important biological phenomena to uh, understand and model this burst, this population burst, is uh, firstly short-term synaptic plasticity. So short-term synaptic plasticity is basically made of two mechanisms that are complementary. One is depression, which is that if you repeatedly stimulate a synapse, because it has a, a limited number of vesicles that are ready to release, and at some point it's basically going to get tired because it won't be able to replete as fast as it's depleting, and so the response that you're going to see over the repeated same stimuli is going to decrease. Then on the other hand, what also happens is that when you repeatedly stimulate the synapse, you have calcium coming in the presynaptic terminal and this facilitates the release of the vesicles. So in the case of a facilitating synapse, you will have an increasing response over the different stimulations. And basically this, this combination of mechanisms is what makes like the burst happening because like the, the cell starts firing, facilitation, which is has a faster time scale starts kicking in. So everyone gets like, super excited, they make like lots of firing. So you see like this big increase. And then at some point, a depression kicks in. It has like a, a slower time scale. And this is where you see like the decrease and like the cells cannot sustain the burst anymore. Another important uh, thing is astrocytes. So uh, yesterday we talked a bit about microglia. Astrocytes are another type of light glial cells. They're actually the most numerous type of cell in the brain. 
Uh, and so they regulate neuronal activity mainly through three pathways. The first one is metabolism. So they, what they do is that they take the glucose in the blood, they convert it into some, something called lact lactate, and they give it to feed the neurons. The other thing is that they have like these small processes that come at the synaptic cleft, and when uh, synapses are activated, they uptake like the, the spillover from the, the neurotransmitter release. And the third thing they do is that also when the synapses are activated, they release uh, extracellular potassium, and astrocytes, they also uptake that to basically clean up the, uh, the external space. So why am I telling you that? The thing is that astrocytes, they're like super cr crucial actually to regulate neuronal activity. In particular, they regulate neuronal bursting activity. I'm gonna tell you more about this in a bit. There's like a very increasing, like quite large literature about uh, astrocyte regulation in sleep. And this is true in REM sleep, but also in slow wave sleep. So this is quite relevant when we're talking about like levels of consciousness. And uh, also, uh, well, we're talking about these patients. They had like a traumatic, well, they had a brain injuries, they have brain lesions. Uh, neurons are affected, but it's pretty safe to think that astrocytes are gonna be affected too, not in the same region. So uh, basically in uh, the studies that actually was just accepted last week, so I'm really happy because it's been ongoing <laughs> with a reviewer for years that I did during my PhD. We worked with Elena Dossi at Collège de France. And what she did that was that, uh, so it was in slices of mouse hippocampus. And what she did is that she knocked out the connections between the astrocytes. So the astrocytes are connected together in a network gap junctions made of specific proteins and you can knock out the existence of these proteins and then all the regulatory activity will be affected no and so what we saw is that if you knock out the gap junction in the astrocyte you do nothing to the neurons and then you look at the spontaneous neuronal bursting in these slices and you get a completely different phenotype so before knockout so in the wild type mice we had like this very big bursts of activity with long interburst interval. Here you, it's hard to see, but it was also like very irregular. So longer bursts, smaller bursts, and longer interburst interval, smaller ones. And then when you knock out the gap junction, you change to this dynamics where you have like this very small, very regular bursts, like uh, super periodic. So the question was like, how, how does it work? What's the mechanism here, no? So Elena, what she did is that she tested these three pathways. No? So she did this uh, mimic experiment when she, where she affected well, uh, the glucose, the glutamate, and the extracellular potassium. And she found out that the regulation was taking place uh, through the regulation of extracellular potassium. So basically, if you take these wild type slices and you reduce the amount of extracellular potassium, you're going to find smaller, more regular bursts. And then if you take the knockout slices and you, re you reduce the amount of extracellular potassium, you're gonna recover this big, large, irregular burst. So that's very nice, but when you increase extracellular potassium, it has various consequences, no? So that's where like uh, modeling comes in because they were like, okay, if we want to test all the possible like pathways and mechanism, it's like a million experiments to do, so we cannot do that. So can you make a model? What we do, what we know is that basically the main things that are going to be affected by extracellular, uh, an increase of the amount of extracellular potassium is that we're going to have more synaptic noise. So you see in the signals here that you have like an increased noise in the, in the knockout. The, the cells are going to be depolarized. And also this period of after hyperpolarization, so it's like after the burst, the cells, they don't go like straight back to like a, to baseline, which would be this dotted gray line. They, there's actually a whole bunch of uh, potassium activated channels that take you like below baseline. So the cells are hyperpolarized and then they're very like slowly come back to equilibrium. So this is like a refractory mechanism. So during this period of after hyperpolarization, the cells cannot fire and so they cannot generate another burst. So it gives them time to recover. So, the initial model I worked with was this model of uh, based on synaptic short-term facilitation and depression. And uh, so it's, it's derived from the original uh, model from Sodix and Markram in the 90s. 
then there were like various evolutions. This version is from 2015. Uh, so you have three variables. You have age, which is like the, the average voltage of your normal population. Uh, X, which would be the facilitation, and Y, the depression. Each of them have their own time scale. So the fastest one is uh, the voltage, then the facilitation, and the depression. So this term is all like just exponential uh, recovery. And then you have these nonlinear terms of how like these events affect the uh, the, the voltage. This J parameter represents like the intrinsic connectivity of your network, and you have like a stochastic noise term. So this model is nice because then here you have the equilibrium for the voltage, so you can play on this parameter to uh, model the depolarization. And here you have the noise. However, this model it doesn't generate a after hyperpolarization. So here you see, because it's average population model, you just see like the big peaks of the burst, you don't see the individual spiking. But you see the model, it can do like these bursts, but, but then after the burst, it go like straight back to resting membrane potential. So I, I adjusted the model so we could also have uh, after hyperpolarization. So uh, basically the idea is to say, okay, now you have a burst, you can decompose like a burst cycle into four phases. So first you're idle, you start the burst, so that's the blue period. This is basically modeled exactly as we saw before because the model was already fine to define that. The thing is that after a while, when you're doing the burst, when you're too depressed, you're not going to be able to sustain the burst. No? So that's when you get like you reach a certain threshold on the depression variable, then you're going to need to start to hyperpolarize. So to do that, uh, what we did is to change just the um, so, and this happens like basically that the, the, the dynamics are now dominated by these M currents that are like medium scale uh, uh, potassium channels. So we change the time scale of the voltage uh, variable to some medium time scale. It's a bit slower. And then you take the T0, which is the resting state, to a negative value to force the voltage to hyperpolarize, to go below zero. And then once you're hyperpolarized enough, down to the third, third time phase, which is the slow refractory period. So here you have like this KC and Q channels that are like a potassium channels with very slow dynamics that kick in. And then they, they, they slowly take you back to equilibrium. So to model that, you put your resting state variable back to zero and your time sale to an even lower, uh, lower value. And then you're back to equilibrium and stage four is the same as stage one. So basically, if you look at it like, uh, from a dynamical system point of view, it's just that you have uh, some state controlled variables. So depending on when you are in your phase space, so that's the voltage, depression and facilitation. Uh, you have like these three regions, which is over here. Here below this orange uh, surface is like the upper hyperpolarization period, and then below the purple surface is the slow recovery period. And so when you look at your trajectories, well, uh, depending on where they are, this defines the value of these parameters. When you do this, you can uh, you can now generate like bursts like before, but then you can also have like this slow after hyperpolarization periods. So, uh, well, the reason I'm telling you all that is to say that then we could use this model to like test these three pathways to see which one was responsible to explain uh, this change in the burst phenotypes that we observed. And we found out that it was mainly the, age, the after hyperpolarization that was responsible for it. And then we could design like specific experiments to test uh, specifically this pathway instead of having to test like all possible combinations. And then the experiments confirmed like the model prediction. So this model that's based on synaptic short-term plasticity and after hyperpolarization, it sorts of, it sorts of indirectly uh, models like the astrocyte regulation of burst uh, of, uh, neuronal activity. And so I decided to like see what happens if I put this model now in you know a whole brain model. Now, so you have the same equation. So you see here. Uh, voltage, facilitation, depression, and then you just need to add like this uh, network term where you have like the effect of the other nodes on your system. Uh, 
Okay, so that was just to show you that you can put like basically whatever you want into the nodes of your of your like whole brain models, and especially when because we're doing it in this latent space. That's why I can also afford to make like a bit more complex models with a bit more parameters because uh, I have reduced my data. You know? And then you have your models, and you have so you have to implement a parameter fitting procedure. No, so as I said. And this parameter fitted, fitting procedure, it's kind of agnostic of the model. So you can like just plug the model in at the simulation step, but you could like replace it with like even another one, depending on what mechanism you're interested in or whatever. And the idea is that so you, you initiate, you initialize your model. So what I do is that I initialize the connectivity between the nodes with the empirical functional connectivity with the latent uh, in the latent space. And then the node parameters, I have I keep the same. It would be nice to see if you could do it like heterogeneous and like having each node to have its own properties, but then you add a lot of complexity again, so I didn't do it. So it's the same in all the nodes. You can initiate them like randomly within like this, uh, well, the authorized parameter space now, parameter values. And then you have like two steps that we're gonna do like iteratively. So the first one is you say, okay, I'm gonna fit for the node parameters using the empirical functional connectivity matrix. So you run like many simulations. I do it several times because, because it's all like stochastic uh, models. Uh, then it's more stable. You run like many iterations, your average. Then you get like your simulated empirical, uh, your simulated functional connectivity, and you want to maximize the similarity with the empirical one. You should do many iterations of that to explore like all your parameter space. And then at some point you stop, you say, okay, so I, I keep like the best parameters for this, I fix it. And now I go to fit the connectivity matrix. So what we want to do is to fit. So uh, yesterday we heard about like functional connectivity and then the effective connectivity that tells you more about like the causal relations. So what we want to do is to fit the effective connectivity matrix with the data. And more specifically, we want to fix what we call the generative effective connectivity, which is this effective connectivity matrix that also accounts for these asymmetries in the influence nodes can have on each other. To do that, uh, you take the empirical uh, functional connectivity and you take also the functional connectivity shifted. So this matrix is just a matrix where for each each time, each, each time series, you shift like one of them from a, a small uh, a small amount of time, and then you take this correlation of this shifted time series with all the other one, and you do this for all the dimensions, and then you get like this asymmetric matrix, and then you run simulations of your model, and you what you try to minimize now to maximize instead of being just a the similarity between the empirical and functional is to some weighted average, some average of both uh, the symmetric functional connectivity and the shifted one, basically. And so you do this, and the idea is that in the end, the generative effective connectivity matrix that you have, it will be like an asymmetric matrix. So it will capture these asymmetric relations between, uh, between nodes. So uh, yeah, this is just an example. So like with the AHP model, of, so on the first line, you have like simulated time series. On the second line, you have the actual data in the latent space. And then you have examples for like one for each group of the empirical uh, uh, functional connectivity matrix and the ones that you obtain uh, running the model. And then you can quantify this. So you can like, and in the end to see if your model is good enough, you can see, so here I did it like at each iteration this is with the HOP model, this is with the AHP model. Uh, so at each iteration, you can see, and I split it for each group to see if like some groups were fitted better than others. Uh, so how similar you manage to obtain a, a matrix. So for the HOP model, it's kind of nice. You see that the second iteration it gets better. Oh yeah, because what I didn't see is that then you get your effective connectivity matrix and then you can start again to fit your node parameters, but now using your effective connectivity matrix. And the idea is that, well, ideally, you would do this until you converge and you don't move anymore. It's very like long and time consuming. So as you can see so far, I've done like few iterations and I'm kind of hoping it's gonna converge rapidly. 
for the hub model, it goes quite well. You see that at the second iteration, you're already like increasing quite much like your fit quality. You get around like between 0.6 and 0.8 uh, of uh, structural similarity uh, between your simulated and empirical, which is quite a good fit. For the after hyperpolarization model, something went wrong, but I see that I had quite a good fit at the first iteration and then it kind of collapsed. I kind of think I have found like the cause of that in my code while I was above, so I'm running it again and I'm hoping it's going to be good. Uh, but so you, you get the idea. And so finally, once you have that, so like now, well, it's going to be like really short and also very preliminary, but then once you have this fit, the idea is that now you can finally use your models not to get some interpretation of your data. So the first type of interpretation, the most straightforward one, is, is, is that you get these new uh, model-based biomarkers, which would be exactly your fitted parameters. No? So for example, if you look at the hop model, the two parameters that you fit is the bifurcation parameter and the noise intensity. And then you see, if you plot, so that for, for all patients, you get like one vector of dimension two, uh, of parameters, which is your new model-based biomarker, and you can see like by groups if you find a difference. So we found that uh, in the bifurcation parameter is quite reduced in the UWS uh, group compared to the two other ones. In the noise intensity, we don't see much difference. And then if you look at the after hyperpolarization model, most so you have more parameters here, but. It's, it's the same now. You have like one vector of parameters for each patient, so that's your new like vector of biomarkers. Uh, so what was kind of nice was that, but as you saw, like the fitting is like has a problem, so we cannot really like trust these results. But like one thing that seems nice is that what we see here is that the, um, the hyperpolarization seems reduced in the patients compared to the controls that which goes in alignment with what we saw in the mouse data, where they also had like, when the network of astrocyte is knocked out, we had like a smaller uh, hyperpolarization. But once again, this, um, so far I'm not trusting it too much because I, I found this bug in the data, so I'm running it again. But well, the idea here is that then you get like these biomarkers and then they have like a more like a straightforward biological interpretation. So this can be nice to like, you, you have to take it with care because like, first of all, we're in like this latent space. So like we have done this dimensionality reduction. We're not sure about the biology of that. Also like we're modeling like very multi-scale things, but it can be like uh, some indication on like where to look. Like if we have like some clear, like some clear parameters uh, associated to some clear um, mechanisms, maybe it can give like some indications of like where we should go and try to like uh, investigate more. But then the other thing is that as uh, Hako told us this morning is that, well, it's nice to look by groups if I can find like uh, differences between the groups, but then within the groups, we have this huge heterogeneity. And the reason why we wanted in the first place to do like the individual patients models was to more like understand this within group uh, variability because as we said before like we kind of already know how to classify these patients between these three groups without having to go through all this hassle of like doing a uh, single patient fitting models and all. so the Z next is like okay maybe we look at the data another way you know so instead of so well I kept I kept like the colors the color code for the patients but then I did like this a uh, UMAP uh, projections so uh, UMAP is like this new fancy dimensionality reduction visualization method. Like for example, the guys at the Allen Institute who do like the uh, like atlas of everything, all types of cell and stuff, they always plot like these very super fancy plots and stuff, it's always UMAP. Uh, and the idea is that this method, it kind of learns like the interesting structure in the data. And for example, if we look like at the, the hop model, we see that we get like very like super defined clusters no, of, uh, of patients. And I know like each dot, I know which patient it is. And so uh, it's like, this is still a bit preliminary, so we don't really know, but then you can say like, oh, look at like in, in this, for example, in this group, I have like lots of these MCS patients that are like classic clustered with 
control patients. So maybe it's a good sign for them, like maybe it's these patients or like uh, the ones that are going to have a good outcome. Yeah. What was the input to the UMAP project? project? Uh, this is my vector. Uh, yeah, the input to the UMAPs is this uh, vector of model based biomarkers <laughs> that I fitted for each patient. So for the HOP model, it's actually also a 2D vector. So there's no dimensionality reduction here. It's just like oh. uh, clustering, basically. For uh, the after hyperpolarization model, you start with eight and you project in dimension two. And yeah, so now like the next step is like so is to like kind of investigate this bit because then you can like you see this and you can have like you see you can have like some clusters. So in the case of the hop model, it's like super easy to cluster, it's like super defined, but also in the AHP model, you see like some sort of structure. And basically this is not quantified yet because I just started to look at it, but and again, like I'm running like the fitting again and everything, but it seems like when I look at it that uh, some patients that seem to be like in the same group with this projection also end up like close together in the other one, which would be kind of nice because then it means that it's not like some artifact of the model, but there are some things that we have from the data. With this, I have to quantify it. The other thing is that because I know which subject is which, then you could like start saying like, okay, how, yeah, well, how does each cluster correlate with like uh, the amount of positive or negative outcome or prognosis or with other features? Because maybe, of course, it would be super cool if it tells you like, oh, this is like good outcome cluster, this is bad outcome cluster, and this gives you prognosis, but maybe it's much more, uh, maybe it just correlates with like sex or age or, well, so the idea is that the next step is to, uh, well, once I'm <laughs> confident about the fitting, would be to more like, a, a try to see how this is like transversely, transversely, like without um, like the level of a uh, of the diagnosis. Uh, how do they correlate with like some metadata, and can they like tell uh, tell us more about uh, about our patients? And uh, so that's it. Just like the summary, where we did like this dimensionality reduction, and we can build like different models depending on the uh, mechanism we want to investigate and to capture and from that we can get like new model-based biomarkers and try to see like a transverse con uh, transverse conditions and then there's still like open questions about of course the biological interpretation of exactly what is this latent space that seems like super stable across like all our data sets uh, is it connected to actually like is there like a connection with the structure and all that I just told you about the clusters interpretation. And that's it. This is uh, Moni again. This is Gustavo's group in Barcelona. This is a consortium with the collaborators. You can see Jacobo here. <laughs> this is our collaborators for, from the project. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. Hi, thanks. I was wondering for the healthy controls, do you think you could scan them uh, during wakefulness, but then also during sleep, then you would like to see them, you know, in dream sleep be more similar to themselves in awake state, but in non REM sleep, they would be unconscious. And That's very sleep. nice. I think it's more a question for <laughs> than for me because I don't do like the, that analysis, but yeah, that would be really nice. Then you would have like all these different stages with your control, mm -hmm. see if they're like more close to. I don't know if you think it's. Yeah, so the same mechanism can be applied to sleep mm -hmm. stages, and like the, the dynamic uh, results I show are, are similar on sleep analysis. So there's a couple of papers showing that uh, the same features that we observe on anesthesia mm -hmm. are somehow resembling certain deep levels of, uh, mm -hmm. of sleep. Yeah, yeah, maybe like depending on the biomarkers, you would see like some of them are same in sleep and some others because like these disorders of consciousness are associated to like maybe spe like see specific parameters that differentiate also between like I don't know deep sleep and disorders of consciousness, whereas others would be like more similar. Yeah, thank you for a very interesting talk. I think please. Um, yeah, so I think it's interesting that you want to connect to the sort of biological neuron models and AHPs and everything. Can you just go back quickly to that 
parameter slide that one, one yeah. yeah it's unfortunate you, you you had some problems with the model so yeah yeah with the fitting so but here you have only two hp one faster and one slower is that yeah so i have like three parameters for the hp which is like the two time scales so the medium one is when you're being hyperpolarized which is more yeah. associated to this m current and then the slow one is like the recovery and this oh. one is like the depth so how how much yeah. you are hyperpolarized but my question is yeah i've done some of this modeling and and the is it the time constant in seconds on the y scale or was it what is it on the high scale? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's in seconds. It's like super large. Okay. So the, yeah, they're so super, super slow actually. Yes, they're super you slow. Can, this is get... actually this is like a bit bigger, but what we got like from the mice data was still like around like 10 seconds for the slow yeah. time scale. But is there yeah. any any sub, any sort of support for those long time constants in, well, it's, it, in yeah, physiology? It comes, it comes from how I, when I fitted it to the actual so from the the mice data, I had like multi electrode array and patch clamp. So in the patch clamp, I had like actually the you can see the actual. This is actually like what I show. Uh, Not really long. Uh -huh. uh, here in the data, like here when you see it, see like this is twenty five seconds. And if you look, so it does. Uh -huh. la it lasts like super long. Well, of course, this one is like the most dramatic one. I choose to like, yeah, but it's. Yeah, it lasts like this hyperpolarization. They last between like five to like 20 seconds easily. Yeah. And so we fitted the time scales to reproduce the data. So basically what I did in this project was that then I segmented all this, all the traces we had into like this uh, burst after hyperpolarization and like resting states. And then I, I fitted the parameter models to reproduce the distributions. Yeah, I got yeah. both for the wild type and the knockout. Yeah, I'm just surprised that, all, yeah, that the AHP time constant we are working with is on the order of 100, 200 milliseconds often. Yeah, for I other bursting system or for, even for quarters. Yeah, yeah, I think it comes from the fact that this is like more of a phenomenological model. So it's not the time constant of the channel itself, you know, like it's a time constant for this model that we produce like just this average time series. Yeah, so it's like yeah. There need to be some slow down constant there. And yeah, what it is physiologically. And well, I mean, you have sodium dependent calcium channels. Uh huh. Yeah. You, you can even do uh, the and then it's really this slow down. And they are long. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Nice. Super small but super slow. Yeah. And it connects nicely with the glia because you have the. Transporters yep. that transport potassium and sodium. So if you mess with potassium, you will mess with sodium. So it's oh, yeah. nicely. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. I was wondering when you do the dimensionality reduction, you showed you get similar results for PCA and you also encode in terms of number of dimensions. You also the spatial patterns match between the two two methods and how are these modes? Uh, no, that's a good question. I, I haven't looked into that yet, but um, I just I basically just looked like at the time series that looked like kind of similar. But then like these spatial patterns and how the modes match to like maybe like the original structure and all is like I kind of have like a side ongoing project on that topic. And so far, no, I haven't I haven't done it. But yeah, it would be really nice. It would would be the same. Yeah. All right. Uh, I think as I was. Oh, no, 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 no. Go, go for it. I didn't see you. Go. Oh, I'm a bit lost. Uh, so, I'll be the devil's advocate here. The models you chuck in have potentially no relationship to the signals you're trying to. Oh, yeah, they have like a, they, they have a. So that relation, like the idea is like, it's a bit like of a reverse engineering approach now. It's like, oh, let's say like, maybe I take these models that account for this, this and that phenomenon. Can I reproduce the same dynamics that what I observe or not? Yeah, that, that's why I'm asking, you know, yeah. can't you just chuck in any kind of model? Fit yeah, it you can. So that's it? like, yeah. Yeah, you can do that's basically like the idea is like maybe like with one model you can be able to like capture super well your data and with another one not and then you're like okay well i know that this model i can discard it and i can discard the, me the mechanisms i'm looking at 
actually, this is also like how it happened when we did this project, was at first I started with the model with just short-term synaptic plasticity without the actor repair polarization. And here when I started like, so first I segmented the time series just between like burst and interburst, and I tried to fit with this model to fit the data. And it was basically impossible. I couldn't make it, like I couldn't get like this long interburst intervals. So now we were like, okay, so maybe like there's, there's actually an important mechanism that we don't capture. Well, this I completely agree, right? Yeah. So this makes, so to fit the burst in the slice, that makes a lot of sense. But taking then this model for that explains some bursting phenomena in the hippocampus to explain the latent space and to fit it and to then interpret these parameters. This is a time constant for some testing channel, which may or may not exist in the cortex of the human or this bursting mechanism may or may not exist there. And the signals you're well, trying to fit- Bursting may, mechanism may probably, I think the, the thing is, of course, like we're looking at the ball time series. So the ball time series is like, it's a very indirect measurement of what's going on inside the brain. So you need to take some assumption. And I think like one of the approaches of doing modeling is like, okay, let's say like maybe this is, oh yeah, so one thing I didn't say is that when I do this model, then I, uh, because this is more like a direct neuronal activity model. So then we add this a uh, balloon Vincessel transformation to simulate the bolt signal. And this is what we fit. So basically the idea is that, yeah, of course, we don't know for sure, but here we can like try and see whether or not some models can like capture better the dynamics that we see and give us some information. And then of course, I wouldn't be like a hundred percent sure that, yeah, this is what's going up, this is what's happening. But then the idea is that it can like, with a model you can take test like more hypothesis and then like a kind of prune a bit like the options and then you go and refine like the investigation at its step. And then about like the latent space part, of course, this is still an open question. There's like a huge body of work right now about like people projecting like data, like a whole brain fMRI data in the latent space. Uh, one of the things is that, and that it's increasing. So I'm working on that on the side, but I'm obviously not the only one, is that people start to think that uh, you, like this functional data, you can all, like that you project into this latent space it somehow correlates and we have like some preliminary investigations that like each of these latent modes, they somehow correlate like maybe to networks or things like that. So we don't, as of yet, have this direct biological interpretation, but it kind of see, seems like all these preliminary investigations so kind of seem to, seem to point to like, probably we're gonna be able to find that. So that's like one argument in favor of that, although it's like still open and I don't know. Another one is that you could do actually like the inverse, uh, the inverse uh, way of thinking. And instead of saying like, I start with this whole brain data and I, I like parcelate it really high and then I reduce it and then I do that, could do like some sort of like a bottom up approach where I would say, okay, so I think maybe Probably because we have probably like neuronal bursting is behind this because neuronal bursting is also what is behind uh, the oscillatory the oscillations in EEG. Then you transform it, you get the bold signal. So this is like it's not a hundred percent sure, but it's a pretty safe assumption. And the other idea would be like, can I get like this level of complexity, like for example, this type of functional uh, interactions, like how many nodes would I need? This, I haven't done it, but it would actually be really interesting. And I have it like, I've done it in another project, like how many nodes, how many dimensions do I, I need if I start with like one population, can I reproduce like the same type of activities? And if I need to connect it to another one, another one. And here you could like start being already informed by the biology also like saying, okay, uh, maybe I put a one population for a, the reticular nuclei of the thalamus and then I put like one for the visual cortex and one for that and you could build it the other way. I haven't done it, but that would be also like a cool approach to it. I have done it in the project for like, where we had like this EEG of, um, so in the EEG of patients undergoing general anesthesia, they have like this a uh, prefrontal alpha oscillation. And th that's at the same time happening with this slow delta oscillations. And we did like actually using this model, we built like a 
a minimal model. So saying like, okay, if we just take one population, can I have like these two types of oscillation at the same time? I can't. So if I connect two of them, can I get these oscillations? I can. And then if you connect three of them, you start being able to reproduce like qualitatively the same type of oscillations that you see in the, so yeah, of course it's like, it's modeling. It's like, I'm not sure this is the truth, but it's like, it's like a, a way to like propose hypothesis. I say that I think that then uh, either biologists or clinicians can like start to get into to see if it fits. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's not my approach. <laughs> There's so many ways how you generate a burst, and this is probably the least likely mechanism by which a burst is generated in the cortex, right? So this is a current injection uh, for prolonged time with a high frequency. There's no, there's no input here. There's no current injections. It's spontaneous bursting. All right. 